Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So today I'm going to discuss a very important topic. First we start with A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahu wa liyu al-ladheena aamanu yakhrijuhum min al-zulumati ila al-nur. Wa al-ladheena kafaru aliyaahum al-taghut. Rukh yukhrijunahum min al-nur ila al-zulumati. Ulaika ashabu al-nar hum fiya qalidun. So Allah Ta'ala gives guidance to those who believe. So one of the very important things that is not understood by economists is that social science is not a science. By science we mean that something which is universal invariant something which holds across time and space, something which holds for Aztecs and for Brazil and for Indians and for Chinese and for Japanese. So there is no such science. There is no law of behavior or action which holds across history, across time, across cultures, across civilizations. And this uh, attempt to create a science is a serious misunderstanding if it's on itself. So once we understand that, then we come to the point that if you want to study social theories instead of science, theories about society, theories about human behavior, theories about culture, then you have to understand that these theories emerge from experience. I look at my historical experience and I try to analyze this. And from this analysis, I come up with some theory, all theories like that. Now, um, one uh, important thing is that my actions and the actions of the people in a society are shaped by these theories. So this, is, this is what I mean by entanglement. History generates theory, theory generates history. Because you cannot understand history as a collection of a sequence of facts. You have to have what are the drivers of this history, what caused this defeat, what caused this failure, what caused this success. Unless you know that, so once you understand the causes which are hidden, it's always from the beginning we have discussed that, there is the appearance and there is the hidden reality. So you make some guess, hypothesis about the hidden reality and on that basis then you act in response. So for example, if you have been defeated many times in battle and you might say that okay this means that I cannot win and so I must accept defeat and then I must learn how to live with defeat or you can say that this means that I didn't try hard enough and I must uh, make more efforts so it's all up, your, up to your interpretation how you how you read the facts that are behind the appearances so depending on this theory this is how you will act so your how history what hist happens in history depends on your theory about history. So these two things interact with each other. This is what entanglement means. They are mixed up with each other. You can't separate them. So his you can't understand history without understanding the theories that human beings made about that history. And you can't understand theories without understanding the history which led to the generation of those theories. So Contrary to what you have been brought up to believe, history is not a collection of facts. History is actually a collection of facts plus a theory about what caused these facts to happen. Once you have this theory, for example, in Islam we have uh, a period in which Islam rose to prominence and then a period in which Islam has declined and it is currently in decline. So now there are many theories about why this happened, the, what is the reason for the current decline. So one of the reasons that people think is that because Muslims didn't keep up with science and technology. So it means that the action, line of action for us is to uh, start studying Western sciences and technology and that's how we can change history. Another reason which is also strongly held by some is that the reason is that we have abandoned Islam and then the 
solution is entirely different. So the same history, but according to the interpretation, what action we will take will be different. So it's not the same collection of facts, but it can ha have different interpretations according to different people. And what that interpretation is will determine how we act, and therefore it will shape history. So a collection of facts is meaningless without interpretation. If we can say, okay, Battle of Plassey, lots lost by two, two ba this battle, that battle, one lost. This is meaningless. It has no uh, significance. Uh, it has to be given an interpretation to make it living. That's why history is boring because people just treat it as a collection of facts and not because, and they don't understand the underlying causes which drive the history. Now the thing is that this is an illusion that has been created by certain philosophies of the West that there's only facts, there's nothing behind the facts. So that makes the theory invisible. So you say you only look at the facts and from the facts we can understand everything that needs to be understood. So just give me the facts, don't give me your opinions. So this is a, a mistake. Uh, that is widely believed that there's only facts, there's no opinions, but actually the opinions are what make the facts possible, make it possible to understand the facts. You can't understand facts without having the theories that fit those facts into some pattern. So uh, this is a quote by Keynes that ideas of economists and political philosophers are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little less. It is actually all of these theories which are driving the world. Different people have different theories and these are the drivers of actions and conflicting theories lead to conflicts and struggles. But because certain ideas about the nature of science in the West are led to the mistaken idea that there's only facts, so the theories became invisible and so nobody can see the effect of the theories. And that is why uh, what Keynes says is that why, why are these ideas, why is it not commonly understood that uh, ideas are important because they were put out of the picture by the theory of social science. Again, this is the interaction between history and theory that this theory makes ideas invisible and that makes it impossible to understand what theories are. So the power knowledge idea of Foucault is exactly reveals the role of theories that actually knowledge which is basically theories about the world is power I mean that is what if you want to act take any action in this world suppose I want to say okay Pakistan is in bad shape let us try to fix it then how will I take action I have to have some theory about what are the things that work to create change. Unless I have a theory, and uh, what, are the the what are the things that caused this current bad situation? So all of these things will determine how I act. So the ideas are very powerful. Ideas shape knowledge, and uh, those who have power can enact and enforce their ideas. The world has ideas uh, and it is not passively ruled by the leaders and those who would like to teach once for all what it must think. Basically the people who get to teach how we must think are the ones who rule the world. <coughs> so now we are taught without any uh, assumption that social science is a science. It is like the law of gravity. So when the law of gravity we study, we don't ask that the law of gravity is in Britain something else and in Pakistan something else. It's the law of gravity. So it's the same everywhere. But this is not true of social. Social science is a deception because social science is a Western theory. It is about, it's based on Western historical experience. It comes out of the history of Europe. So you can't understand social science unless you understand history of Europe. And uh, one of these elements of European history is the battle of methodologies, 
which took place in 1890s. It's called the Methodenstreit German name because it was based on and uh, there were two schools of thought about social theory including economics. One was the historical school, it's called the German historical school and um, the other was the Austrian school led by Menger. So um, the scientific school said that no, economics is a science, it's universal laws which hold across time and place and it's based on mathematics and it's based on measurement and counting. And the other school of thought said no, economics is a branch of history. You have to study specific things, how, how, um, how nations evolve, change, emerge, what are the battles and so on. So the, basically the wrong school won the battle, the scientific school won and as a result you can study eight years of um, uh, economics, get a PhD and never know what are the major economic events, history of history in the 20th century. What was the Great Depression? What was World War One? What was World War Two? These are all things which had major imp economic impact, but according to economic theory, this is irrelevant because these are just one-time events. These are not part of science. But actually the truth is that economics is part of history. You can't understand economics unless you understand what happened. If you say that there is a universal law and if you want to study the trade theory for Pakistan and India, it will be the same as the trade theory for Brazil and Venezuela, which is what economics says, it's wrong. But this is what is widely believed and this is what the textbooks say that you are studying. So because of the method and strike, Europeans reject this idea that theories are grounded in history. And so what I'm teaching you is uh, that uh, something which is not accepted by Western social scientists. Anybody who calls himself a social scientist automatically believe, disbelieves this theory because to say that it is a science is to reject the history. So now uh, once we understand this then we understand that economic theory itself is a product of European historical experience. It's, it's such a bizarre theory that uh, yani just think that if we just uh, burned all of these books of economics and we said okay let's think about from zero how we would think about the economy you would never get there and you would never get to utility maximization rational beliefs and so this is just so far away from normal thinking that so it, it didn't come just by itself like like that out by magic it came through a historical process and so we have to understand that historical process in order to understand uh, what this theory is. And um, again there is one thing that uh, is uh, widely believed, for example Krugman says it, that see you don't need to understand history because all you need is the true theory. If uh, Take current theory, if it's false then reject it and put the right theory and that's it. I mean we all we need is true and false. We don't need history, we don't need to understand what Keynes said because uh, it doesn't matter whether Keynes, uh, Keynes said it or not, what matters is whether it's right or wrong. But actually this is not true because theories, regardless of whether they are right or wrong, they shape history. So we have to know what Keynes said in order to understand what happened after uh, World War I because what people did was shaped by Keynesian theory and so history and economics was shaped by Keynesian theory regardless of whether it's right or wrong. So because theories shape history and because economics is historical, we must understand theories in their historical context whether they are right or wrong. And this is something again not understood by Krugman. He argues exactly the opposite. He says we don't need to understand what Keynes said and what he meant because all it, that matters is whether it's true or false. So, um, European history is a long and complicated subject, but some very important points which, uh, which have an impact on the shape of modern economic theory, I must go through especially because this is not understood by Europeans themselves, because this is an outsider's view. I am looking at European history from, 
from inside you can't see just like you can't see your own face so the Europeans are not aware of uh, their own history so um, first there is a dramatic change in thinking from 1492 to 1776 this is what Tony has said um, in his uh, famous book the I forgot the name uh, anyway this is um, his statement that in the 16th century you have a theory of hierarchy of values at the top you have religion which controls all aspects of life and then um, from this you get to all dimensions of life, politics, economics, society, everything is shaped by ideas of religion. In the 18th century this conception is gone. Now we have religion occupies one particular special actually personal sphere about how my emotions and my feelings but the um, economic theory, political science, social science, all of this religion has nothing to do with it. These are so th this is a dramatic revolution in thinking. How did this happen? This is a very important uh, element of European history because this was not a gradual change, it was a revolution and thought and that's very important. The battle was fought and the same battle is currently going on in uh, Islamic society these days. So if we understand how that battle took place then we will have a better understanding of who we are and what what is happening in our world. So how did Europeans lose their faith in religion? This is very important because all modern European thought is based on the rejection of religion. Marxism, capitalism, socialism, all of these lines of thinking. Now what the Europeans say about themselves, the internal view, the self-perception is that you know we were foolish and we were immature and we were ignorant and we were superstitious and then slowly the light of reason dawned and we started to think clearly and we invented mathematics and science and all of the great things and we realized that religion is just superstition and we replaced it by reason and logic. And so there was progress, just like we, we developed, we matured and we were, became enlightened. So first there was the dark ages and then the light of reason came and then we became intelligent and we rejected religion as a bunch of superstitions. So this is the story that is told, the, the internal story, the self told, but actually the reality is quite different from this story. So. There is a huge, I mean, history is complex, you can't really reduce it to any particular, uh, but, but there are four big things which stand out. One of them, this started in actually 1492, the critical date, it's a very important date. Um, corruption of the popes, these were the, these are the renaissance, this is the period when Renaissance means rebirth, so Europe was being reborn because actually in 1492 the conquest of Spain was completed, so the Islamic civilization for the first time, all of the treasures of them came into the, the Islamic Spain was far more advanced civilization relative to Europe, which was in the dark ages, so when they conquered, and uh, one thing is that why did they conquer it, well it was 800 years. Uh, the uh, Europeans have been in in, uh, in their ascendance for only 300 years right now. So, in 800 years, every civilization will grow and mature and age. And basically, this is a cycle which has been described in the Quran that you initially you are young and energetic, and later on you become corrupt and decadent and uh, enjoy luxuries. And any barbarians can invade you and uh, and successfully because you have forgotten how to fight. So, um, because of the corruption of the Renaissance popes, uh, the uh, people became disgusted with 
the Pope's behavior and uh, Martin Luther especially uh, created the Protestant religion as a because of the uh, his uh, uh, rejection of the Catholic uh, Church and now this created a split in Christianity and then these two people fought very bloody battles and again this uh, led to first of all there was this disenchantment how come our leaders of religion the ones who tell us everything and the ones actually in, in Islam it's quite different from Christianity in that the Pope is actually supposed to be infallible. He is supposed to be the representative of God on earth. So if he does something wrong, then there is something wrong with your religion. As opposed to us, we are individually responsible for revolution, uh, for, for the religion. Even if some of the leaders are corrupt, it doesn't have any effect on the religion. Because the leaders are, are responsible for their own deeds and we are responsible for our own. So, uh, that was a, a shock to the faith of the people. Then the bloody battles between the Catholics and Protestants, each one claiming to be the sole truth. That was another shock to the people. Then the third major point was that Christianity itself had incorporated very unrealistic ideas like you shouldn't marry, you shouldn't have riches and so the ordinary people could never um, any follow this. So they said, well, religion is just another name for hypocrisy. You say something and you do something else. And then there was this uh, event in 1755, the Lisbon earthquake, in which there was a huge uh, damage done to a very advanced city in Portugal, which we'll discuss. And people said, how can this happen? God is cruel. So, um, uh, this was another major shock factor. So, these are the four factors that I have identified. There are many others, but we can work on these. So, I am going to go into a little bit more detail because it is very important to understand and this history is not available from any European source. So, in 1492, three major events, world-changing events happened. One of them was the conquest of Spain by, reconquest of Spain by, um, by the Christians. The last uh, Muslim uh, city was destroyed. And um, the second was the sailing of Columbus for the uh, New World, the Americas. And uh, the third was this election of Rodrigo Borges, who was a very corrupt, actually he was not elected, he bought the uh, Pope ship by paying money as, you know, people buy offices. Um, and basically the saying that power corrupts was said about the Popes because they had all the power in Europe and they used this power and they abused it and they were flaunted it. They were not hiding their faults, they were openly displaying their... So this was actually very harmful to the public who saw that our leaders are doing this, our religious leaders. You see, if the leaders, the secular leaders do this, it's not a problem for a religion. But if the person who is the representative of God on earth is doing something wrong, then you say, is my religion correct? So there was basically uh, about... Um, the offices of the Pope, uh, the church, were very uh, lucrative because uh, all of the people had to pay 10% of their money to the church. So people would buy these offices and then they would uh, hire some people to d deliver the sermons and they would enjoy their lives with the money. And so it was there was widespread disregard of the laws of the church. I mean, they had rules that the priests should be celibate, they should have poverty, but they had luxury, illegitimate children and everything. There was very sinful behavior, not just among people, but among the heads of the church, the leaders of the religion. This was really caused. And then when they were running out of money, they, they um, raised money by selling indulgences. So you can sell money. Uh, if you have done a sin, then you can get it pardoned by paying money. And when that was not enough, they started selling in advance. Okay, you can go and murder somebody next year. Here's your <laughs> indulgence. <laughs> so, 
all of these things was very harmful to the be faith of the people so there is a chapter by barbara tuckman on in her book called the march of folly which says that the renaissance popes provoked the protestant session secession they, they said they did so much damage that they actually caused the pro, uh, the secession the uh, split of the church between the catholic and the uh protestants so this is again a quote from Bar uh, barbara tuckman she says that there was a folly perhaps the most consequential in western history she said this was the most important event in european history the shattering of the church into the catholic and the protestant because it laid the seeds for the rise of secular thinking and uh, it resulted in centuries of hostility and warfare this is also very important that basically europeans have been continuously at war with each other this has also shaped their mentality and history so um uh, second topic i mean one was the uh, uh, the popes they created they caused the uh, um, secession of the protestant they they caused the split by their very uh, openly sinful behavior they split the church then uh, there were many bloody battles between catholics and protestants so the first of these was the saint bartholomew's day massacre this was an amazing event because basically the queen of england said and it's not clear why uh, she had a daughter she wanted to unite or she said she wanted to unite the protestants and the catholics which were fighting in france and uh, there had been lots of bloody battles so she invited uh, henry of navarre to marry her daughter and so basically henry of navarre was protestant and her daughter was catholic so that to unite the two so when they came and uh, the wedding party came and thousands of very famous leaders of the protestants came that okay this is peace then they murdered them while they were sleeping and they ordered uh, of a country wide massacre of the protestants so they they had pl plotted this so once the signal was given the whole country was uh, all you know, innocent people were killed and this was the start and then uh, basically the protestants until then they had thought okay there's uh they are, we are two different religion and then they said these are the spawn of the devil these are the and so they had very strong feelings about each other so the 30 years war took place in uh, central europe between 1618 and 648 and it had 8 million ca casualties if you look at the proportion of population it was more deadly than world war 1 and world war 2 combined uh, uh and um basically it was wars between catholics and protestants uh, killing each other uh catholics were trying to impose a religion by force and protestants were fighting against this there was the persecution of heretics it was really very terrible in the sense that uh we will see hopefully some of this uh the inquisitions they they had unbelievable kinds of tortures uh to each other inhuman completely so these were the atrocities again all of these things became associated with religion that this is the uh, in the europeans mind so again it's easy to understand why they rejected religion but one mistake that they did make and which unfortunately because we read european books we make the same mistake they thought that all religions are the same without studying them so they said well, since christianity is like this so all religions are like this and so they didn't never bothered to study that maybe there is some other religion which is different from christianity so uh, these are the uh, we have discussed the two factors 
corruption of popes leading to the split in the church and then the wars and the tortures and the um, inhuman treatment of each other by protestants and catholics and the third factor is that the christianity itself was a collection of ideals which is totally impossible for human beings to follow except for a rare few so allah taala says in the holy quran that we gave jesus son of mary uh, gave him the gospel and give gave him compassion and mercy in the hearts of those who followed him but rahbaniya they invented for themselves we did not command it for them but they did not observe it properly so those who did follow rahbaniya doing yani taking exceptionally uh, yani retiring from the world for the sake of allah's pleasure allah taala gave them reward but most of them were evil doers so if you compare again uh, islam and christianity the corinthians say it is not good for it is good for a man to not marry and uh, again there are other verses which says that don't uh, 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 poverty is good wealth is bad and uh, christians used to torture themselves that this is what allah taala wants and so many people reacted very strongly to this saying christianity is just a very very bad religion the evil christian is evil religion many philosophers said that because they uh, so as opposed to this in islam marriage is my sunnah allah taala rasul said and he said to that it is a sawab a virtue to kiss your wife so the sahaba were very surprised that why is this so when you get pleasure from this so he said that well it prevents you from doing the haram so this is this is not just uh, there are so many incidents when sahabi was um, fasting every day and um, praying every night his wife complained and he said that you have the duty to your body your nafs and on your family not just to god so in many many places it's very clear that service to human beings is valued above ibadat instead of saying doing itikaf you go out and help your fellow human being so these are these are the real practical religion unlike christianity which says that just shut yourself in a cave and worship and that is the highest form and yes it says that okay if you cannot achieve to this ideal then you can marry it is said that if you are weak you can marry but this is a concession to human weakness is it not uh so this is a different thing that uh, okay even if you are married and having a normal life you feel guilty that okay i'm not doing the right thing as opposed to this islam says no normal human life is ideal and you can be in worship 24 hours of life while you're eating while you're sleeping all of these things as long as you do them according to the sunnah and the prophet sallallahu said that look and if some of the sahabi said to, from now on i will fast every day from now on i will i will pray all night he said no don't do that i sometimes days i fast some days i eat some, day, some nights i pray and sometimes i sleep so um he uh, he created a balance model he was uh married to one woman for 10 years uh he provided the ideal model for monogamy he provided the ideal model for polygamy he provided ideal models in every path of life as a trader as a um statesman as a leader as a warrior all in all areas of life he provides us with guidance not just sitting in a cave so the fourth pillar on which european uh, atheism is built is the lisbon earthquake it was one of the uh, lisbon was the capital of portugal portugal was one of the early countries which rose to uh, uh Uh, had imperial colonies all over the world they were very rich and lisbon was their capital and it was a and it was november when all saints day 
and it was a Sunday and people were praying and worshipping in the churches and then there was a huge earthquake uh, which destroyed all the churches and then after the uh, that there was a big uh, uh, tsunami wave which came in and killed lots of people after that uh, there was a big fire so I mean it was clear that there is an azab of Allah and it was not something simple and um, it was the deadliest earthquakes ever recorded so so the Europeans were very puzzled how did God destroy why did God destroy this perfectly peaceful city top 10 most evil empires in history were massacred by the invaders a further 3 million died as a result of a smallpox epidemic after the disease was brought to the region by the Spanish. The Spanish Inquisition was also introduced throughout the empire to ensure that the population adhered to their interpretation of the Catholic faith. An estimated 150,000 people were interrogated and tortured. One of their favoured methods involved the head crusher, a metal cap that compressed the head using a screw until the skull shattered. Another was the knee splitter, a vice-like instrument covered in spikes that mutilated the victim's knees and leg bones so that they couldn't walk. Number 8. The Portuguese Empire, 1415 to 1999. Portugal's empire sought to spread Catholicism around the world and profit from the agricultural and gold resources of others. They expanded into South America, Africa, and Asia. More than five million people died in the five process. Five million is a long, Widely big number. to have introduced the transatlantic slave trade, they Portugal created the slave trade. more than four and a half million people out of Africa, almost twice as many as any other colonial power. Most were severely mistreated, and disobedient slaves were lashed, burned with hot wax, or sexually assaulted. Meanwhile, in India, Portugal established the Goa Inquisition, in which Hindus were burned at the stake and boiled alive with molten oil. All this to convert people to Christianity. In the 20th century, Portugal faced international pressure to release its African colonies, but refused to do so, and responded in the 1970s by massacring its enslaved people. Thousands were executed and tortured. Teenage girls were crucified on trees and had their breasts cut off. Men were castrated, and children had their eyes gouged out. So after this they ask why did Allah Ta'ala do this to them? Um, the Lisbon earthquake was a serious uh, blow to the faiths and there is this whole theory that is called Theodicy. Theodicy or Theodicy means that how can a just and merciful God do things on earth which are cruel and evil and uh, bad. So this is a whole theological problem for which uh, Christians even now they are uh, writing books about this that how can it be now we have very clear explanations of this in the hadith and the Quran that basically if people do something evil then Allah Ta'ala visits catastrophes on them and Aisha Razila Ta'ala asked will it hit both the good people and the bad people so the Prophet said yes when the catastrophe comes, all, all will be destroyed, the good people. On the judgment day, they will be separated. But when you, when you have a, a, a azab of Allah, it hits everybody, whether they are good or bad. So we have no difficulty with understanding this. But the Christians have a major problem. They don't understand how this can happen. So... The um, fourth, uh, okay, now that those were the pillars for the loss of faith. Now, one of the consequences, uh, what we want to do, study is the mindset. There are certain fixed ideas in the minds of Europeans until this day, which they can't get rid of. And uh, these ideas are very harmful. And these are the reason for this uh, current state of the world. One of these is the perpetual warfare is a way of life. Uh, after the um, after the Reformation, which was the basically the emergence of the uh, Protestants, uh, between 1560 and 1715, there was only 30 years of peace, continuous warfare. 
the growing division between Christian and Protestants led to a series of armed conflict for over a century and the final result was the overthrow and execution of Charles I in England in the middle of the 17th century which permanently changed the face of Europe. Actually this overthrow of Charles I it has a lot to do with economic theory that we will study. The economic theory was born and industrialization and all of the modern Capitalism was born because of this religious struggle. So Polanyi, uh, whose book I am also following somewhat here, uh, he uh, writes in the introduction that the 19th century produced something which is not known to Western civilization, namely a hundred years of peace from 1815 to 1914. Now, one thing uh, that is important to understand, and he writes that uh, this peace is only between the European powers. It was not any yani, uh, Germany and France and England didn't fight each other. There was no peace in the planet. There was a incessant, uh, continuous series of wars, uh, which accompanied the march of industrialization, industrial civilization, into outworn cultures or primitive peoples. Yani, the whole globe was colonized. Basically the Europeans got together and said the world is big enough, let's not fight each other, let's go and conquer it. So they conquered it and about the completion of global conquest was about at the end of the 19th centuries and around 1900. And in 14 years, because the globe had all been conquered, they started fighting each other again, World War One, World War Two. They don't know how not to fight each other. I mean this is uh, in fact, I, one of the leaders of the European Union, he was giving a talk in Turkey and he said that basically one of the major driving forces for the creation of the European Union was the, our realization that we have never been able to avoid wars. So now that the, um, uh, that the um, um, situation has changed over there when the Russia, basically it was, uh, Russia had become weak and so we are united against Russia. Now that Russia is not there, uh, we are going to start fighting again. So let's create such strong economic linkages that uh, we won't be able to fight each other. So this is a uh, quote from somewhere, I don't remember. In Europe, the kings and princes had been raised to fight one another with toys, soldiers, spikes, firearms as children. Same thing is going on today. The children are being trained by uh, these war games. They are taught to enjoy flowing blood. I mean, you have this blood on and blood off on these violent games so that you can watch, you can shoot somebody and watch the blood flow down and enjoy it. I mean, this is training, part of training to be one of the conquerors of civilization. Uh, Machiavelli taught them and uh, there were many advisors to the prince actually there's a whole category of mirrors to princes how you should train princes so they said that the the only goal of princes should be to uh, to understand war uh, like louis the 14th said that uh, victories are the great expectations of the public so the children took this and the princes took this lesson to heart and they pursued war. Fighting had gone beyond the needs of defense and in the words of Galileo, it was a royal sport. It is a game that we play because our lives are not at stake. It's the lives of the ordinary people. So one of the missionaries who visited Peking and uh, spent 28 years in China noted, I was very surprised to note that China could easily conquer, it was a big and powerful and there were many small neighbor kingdoms like Vietnam and Laos, others in its neighborhood. If China wanted to, it could have conquered them, it had a huge army, much bigger than. But the emperor and the Chinese had no interest in doing so. This is very different from our countries, our European kings are driven by the insatiable desire to extend their dominion, which is as true today as it was centuries ago. So now 
the loss of religion and this perpetual wa warfare actually uh, causes emotional damage. It makes you unable to feel certain things about humans. And so one of the things is that that came um, was a distrust of experience because religion was based on experiential knowledge. People feel the presence of God. There is no logical argument or at least uh, one part of the religious experience has to do with the feelings of the heart. So then uh, Europeans started to un uh, try to understand where morals come from if there is no God because morality is what Allah Ta'ala tells us to do that is what's moral so if the, uh, there is no God then how can we be moral people also we don't trust experience because we have been burnt by our experience we found that everybody believed in God but this was a a betrayal. Uh, 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 some people were deceiving us for their own purpose, you see. By making us believe in God, the popes were actually just trying to enjoy life. So, having been deceived once, you don't want to be deceived again. And so, you don't trust uh, your feeling of the heart. And once you don't trust feeling of the heart, then you say that, okay, I think, therefore I am, because you <laughs> are... I feel therefore I am you can't accept that so then they said okay what can we trust if we can't trust our books and if we can't trust our religious leaders they said okay we will trust what we can touch and we can see and this is what science is empiricism this is where empiricism was born that only only believe in the facts don't believe in opinions because opinions can lead you astray there was also the desire to build heaven on earth. We must collect wealth because there is no heaven. So we must become rich. Humans are just another type of animal. After all, if there is no God, then... So this is the evolutionary thinking. So Skinner says that we have to go beyond freedom and dignity. Freedom and dignity, these are just ideas. We are just like other animals. We eat, we drink and we kill and we rob. Man is just a robot conditioned by, you can condition him to do good, you can condition him to do bad, it's all the same. This was, uh, yani the enlightenment philosophers were very deeply affected by these events and they created philosophies of, uh, of atheism, basically Hume. Uh, they said that God is cruel and unjust. Uh, they tackled uh, the problem of ex explaining the existence of evil. Ayub alayhi salam was discussed that look how God is torturing his own favorite uh, people. And they said that basically it's not, there is no God. There cannot be a God like this. Such a God is just uh, unacceptable. So basically it is not that God has created us, it's that we have created God. So, there are many consequences to the loss of faith, uh, the, the trauma. So, this is one of the, Bertrand Russell, one of the famous atheists of the 20th century. And he writes that man has just came about by accident. Whatever we believe, however we love, how, how heroic we are, how deeply we think, how wise we are, makes no difference. We are all going to be dust in the end. Same thing that the Kuffar said in the Mecca to Prophet ﷺ that whatever you do, it doesn't matter, you are all going to die. What we will be, these, this, these flesh and bones, they will rise again? How can that be? So all of the things that we do, whether we do them individually or collectively, this will all perish when the death of the solar system and all of our achievements will be buried beneath, beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things are nearly certain. If you want. So, but this is a tragedy. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, you see, all of these things, this is a tragedy. I mean, 
if I do good, nobody there's no value to it because nobody is watching, nobody appreciates my good. If I just kill everybody in this classroom right now, it makes no difference. Nobody cares. No, it doesn't matter. Nobody is watching. Nobody will punish me. So this is a, a source for despair. Yani, there's not no good, no bad, nothing. This universe is cold and cruel and different. So only on the heart of this tragedy can you build. And so he goes on. Brief and powerless. Uh, there is a slow, sure doom, blind to good in evil, omnipotent matter. The, the whole universe is governed by forces of matter. It, it rolls along and it kills everything that comes in its way. Man will lose his dearest and I myself will pass through the gate of darkness. And the only thing we can do is have some few moments, of, snatch a few moments of pleasure out of this tragedy. So, apart from the loss, loss of faith, there was this trauma from continuous warfare. The world is a jungle, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, either it's you kill or you be killed. Uh, so this idea of competition, cutthroat competition, that the firms work in the world like this, that we are always looking for profits and if I, you're not watching, I'll cut your throat and if I'm not watching, you cut mine. And this is how um, this is how efficiency arises. This has nothing to do with the reality of the world, but this is the theory that was created by Adam Smith. Actually, people think that, um, any, uh, that uh, Darwin got his idea of theory of evolution and jungle uh, law of the jungle from uh, Adam Smith, actually. This is how. Now, Actually, uh, this is not t true. I mean, what he was arguing from, the law of the jungle, is not true of the jungle. <laughs> it was true of the Europeans, but it was not true of the jungle, and it was not true of human beings in general. So, there was Huxley. Huxley was a follower of uh, Darwin, and basically he wrote that nature is brutal, perpetual battle. It's either kill or be killed. There is a ruthless struggle for survival. Only the strongest, the swiftest and the cunningest, the ones who can use trickery and deceit, they live to survive. No quarter is given, there is no mercy, no, no pity. And enduring suffering is the, is the yani, whether you are the victor or the vanquished, the, only, the life is all about suffering. I mean, even if you are victor, you are worried that somebody tomorrow is going to come and kill me and of course you are killing all the time to try to protect your position. Now as opposed to this, uh, Kropotkin who was a Russian, he said that this is completely wrong description of nature. He, he had lived in real nature and he had seen the jungle and he said that. Uh, he wrote an article to rebut Huxley, uh, his, uh, his sequence of articles which is called Mutual Aid Among Animals. And he showed that there is an yani, infinite number of examples where animals cooperate, they get together, <coughs> they sacrifice for each other. There is one guard <coughs> who stands and says, uh, uh, shouts and all of the other animals flee and he stands his guard in order to, and, and sacrifices his life so that his people can flee. So he gave yani, examples after examples after examples that you can't justify being ruthless and cruel and violent because animals are because animals are not like that. That is worse than animals. And Allah Ta'ala also says this in the Quran that the, their hearts have become like stone and even worse than stone because even stones they can split apart and the water can flow. So even stones. So uh, these people they thought uh, that the humans are have no hearts. So what were the forces which led to global conquest by Europe. Uh, uh, part of these, uh, an important part of these were these ideas of perpetual warfare, of there being no God, of there being 
survival of the fittest and battle of all against all. So, uh, because of this, these ideas about the world, they went on this mad journey of global conquest for uh, no purpose, uh, any killing and destroying all that we saw in this short clip. So, uh, but one of the reasons was, yani if you look at, uh, th those were the ideas, the ideological reasons. Now we look at the material reasons. So one of these was this industrial revolution, which we will study in greater detail later. It led to surplus production on a massive scale. You can produce. Now, uh, the pre-capitalist idea of society is based on self-sufficiency. So if you produce excess, what are you going to do with it? There's nothing to do. So once you have an industrial society, which is producing huge amounts, then you need to find people who will buy this good. So, uh, uh, perpetual warfare had led to a military revolution. The Europeans had much better war techniques than anybody else in the world because they had centuries of continuous fighting while other people were living at peace. So, um, once they had to sell these goods, then they said, okay, how will we uh, sell these goods? They went and they destroyed a huge number of societies. All were functioning self-sufficient societies. They were living peacefully and they were getting by. And they destroyed them and they destroyed their culture and they destroyed their means of production and they turned them into uh, consumers. They, they started like uh, uh, they had laborers in London who were working in the factories and they gave them sugar which was uh, in wages which was a great luxury and they took slaves from Africa to grow sugar and they took them the products that were of the shirts which they were not wearing from manufactured by the factory. So this is a mutual chain of consumption bringing benefit to no one but creating wealth in the uh, coffers of the capitalists. So this excess production, who's going to consume it? <laughs> Nobody. So you take these slaves and you make them work in the fields to produce uh, uh, sugar cane. Now because they're only producing sugar cane, they can't take care of their lives, so you give them wages in terms of the products that you produce. So this is civilization. So as I said, there are some material forces which lead to global con colonization and there are also some ideas, the theory, the history and the, the material forces, the facts of history are intertwined with the ideas of history. And so you have to study them both together if you want to have understanding. So uh, now it is not normal, it is not human that okay, uh, we are living peacefully at home, we have everything we need and we go out and conquer the other country. <laughs> Why? <laughs> they are also living at peace. Let them be. No, this is not something which is even enters the mind of the European. So Machiavelli, he taught that the only object is war. The more power you have, the better. <coughs> how you get war? How you get power? Uh, you can lie, cheat, deceive, be ruthless, <coughs> crush your enemies. He said that if you want power, Love is ridiculous. Don't, don't try to get power by getting your people to love you. Uh, that is one way. He discusses it that yes, if, peop if your people love you, then they will obey you. He says, uh, that's nonsense. Power is obtained by cruelty, by, by shock, by punishment. The people should fear you, then they will obey you. That's more reliable than love. Love is weak. So, <coughs> He said that um, uh, one of the, uh, the other idea, well, everybody is human. They have in their heart the idea that uh, you should not hurt uh, or torture. So uh, racism was invented to support global contrast. That these people, the brown people, the black people, they are animals. They are not real human beings. So we can do whatever you like to them. It's not... You don't have to worry, you don't have to have human feelings about them. So one of the things that supported this idea was the idea that, <clears throat> you know, we are the unique scientists of the world. We 
we are the only ones who know how to do mathematics we are the only one who knows how to do science we are the only one who invented democracy so we are the human beings the rest are just animals and there was this social darwinism which we have already described that life itself is just a jungle and civilization is meaningless and freedom and dignity are meaningless it's just a cruel and ruthless survive battle for survival so as i said in the 19th century for 100 years the europeans did not fight each other from 1815 to 1914 uh minor small fights and this was this was a mirac- miracle according to polani it can't uh, well because that they had the whole globe to conquer and for in 100 years they conquered the globe but after they conquered the globe then again they started fighting each other so in early 20th century 90% of the globe came under the european powers in a 1940 european wars began again and 1944 there was the second world war with the shaft after a short pause and these were the most destructive wars in human history if you look at absolute numbers and the european youth was wiped out in particular in germany there were no young men left so today the immorality that we see is partly a result of this there were german women had a, a demonstration in the streets that the bible allows polygamy we should be allowed to have multiple marriages but the church did not listen the german girls went out into the world to find husbands because there was no none to find in germany and immorality became common because there was such a huge shortage of men and such a huge surplus of females so a uh, why did world war 1 and world war 2 come about well what general smedley Bet- butler says in this article that i linked is something very strange he says that there were 20000 millionaires who became millionaires because of world war 1 and if you want to understand the causes of war it's these people that you have to look at all wars that are taking place bring profit to somebody today the largest arm exporter of the world is usa and they arm both sides in iran and iraq and they sell wars because uh, there are wars and so uh, for them it doesn't matter who is killing who as long as they can sell weapons uh, this is enough so this uh, in order to foster this you have to have a certain mindset which europeans have so there is a famous novel by hg wells called the war of the worlds the martians come to the earth and what did they think they start invading and not just this there are many many novels and stories in which whenever you have an encounter with the aliens you start fighting them the idea uh, that two civilization can meet and cooperate and trade and learn from each other and live in peace this idea is not exist in the mind of the european so samuel huntington says that you know the days of nations are over so nations are no longer going to fight wars but now it's going to be civilizations and there will be a clash <laughs> the idea that you can have civilization in the true sense of the world doesn't exist in the mind of the latest the greatest thinkers at harvard they cannot imagine a world in which there is peace so uh, just looked at the encyclopedia britannica so there are 22253 entries for war and 4289 entries for peace i just put in these search terms so about 5% <laughs> so this is the how much they are obsessed with war if you look at uh, there are ministries of war all over ministries were renamed to be ministries of defense but there are no ministry of peace how can we achieve peace nobody is interested in that so there were 
major problems for secular thought. Once you abandon religion, you see, now uh, um, you have very serious problems about uh, how we are going to organize our life. Now some first question is, how did the universe come into existence if there is no God who created it? So the answer that they gave for a long time was that it is eternal. So, um, Allah Ta'ala is awwal uh, wal uh, and he, is, um, he has no beginning and no end. So he said, no, the universe itself has no beginning. Now it turned out this was wrong, which leads to a serious problem. But anyway, so what is the purpose of life? What, uh, so again, there is no purpose to life. Uh, it's just accident. By accident we came into being. By accident we will die. You can do whatever you like. Uh, th this philosophy was formulated. This is called the existentialist, existentialist philosophy. And it had a great impact. We will see. Then there's practical questions. How should we construct politics? So how should we construct society? What should be our behavior with each other? Do we need to have families? or Are there other methods for organizing society? How should the economy be constructed? In all of these questions, religion provided answers. Now that they reject religion, so basically social science is the name of humans trying to use their reason to find out the answer to these questions which previously religion had given. So this is social science. This is what the meaning of social science. That all of these questions which previously were answered by Bible, we can't trust the Bible anymore. So now we have to figure this out for ourselves. And so use logic and reason and data and empirical to find out the answers to these questions. And that is what social science is including economics. So, one of the basic, the reasons why secular thinking came into being, the urgent and the burning reason was, how can we stop this fighting between Catholics and Protestants and different sects? So, this was a burning reason. Uh, on this, I mean, if, uh, the secular thinking came into being not because of the atheists, but because the religious leaders were agreed that, yes, this has got to stop. I mean, okay, while we are in power, we can kill the others, but then when we lose, then they will kill us. So better than that, we should have an agreement on some ground which nobody, uh, which uh, without religion, so that people can agree. So that's what the, that's what the basis was, that yeah, the uh, rejection of religion took a long time. Uh, but the ground for secular thinking was prepared earlier. So now how can we achieve peace if people are at war with each other? So the simple thing is let everybody be free. So this idea of freedom became a pillar of Western thought as a result of the attempt to, uh, uh, to stop the fighting that was going on in Europe. So now, of course, there's lots of freedom. But actually, if you think about it, freedom is itself not a desirable thing. In Islam, we have everybody is a slave of Allah. And, and also, uh, yani freedom is very, yani it's very clear in all societies that we cannot give people freedom to destroy society. If there is, um, if you have want to do something but it is harmful to society then you should not do it so the social responsibility is more important than individual freedom this is the trend everywhere the the general thinking and the correct idea but in europe they could not hold on to this because different people had different ideas about social responsibility <coughs> so they said that so there was an important transition that was made in uh, secular thought. The original conception in Europe and in all other societies is that we are all working together for a common goal. So both freedom and democracy are 
uh, not quite correct in this conception because if you're working together for a common people, different people will be doing different things. Somebody will be cleaning the garbage, somebody will be uh, doing the, um, the th uh, running the think tanks and somebody will be executive in the government, somebody will be in the army. Different people will have different roles, different functions, different kinds of privileges. So um, equality is only in principle and uh, but but we are all nonetheless equal in the sense that we are working together for the same purpose so equality is, is at a higher level as opposed to this the secular society uh, broke away from this thought they said that no there is no common purpose different people have different purposes so we have different groups and so now society has to be re conceived instead of having a common purpose which is given by religion then everything is subordinate to that common purpose everything serves the so if we want to decide is this good or this bad we ask is this going to serve the common purpose or is it not so we have a clear guidance for deciding on uh, any issue whether it's politics whether it's economics uh, we, we have a common purpose but now when you go away from the concept of society as an organism working together then you have to think of society in a different way and this is the, what the key to secular thought is that there are different groups with different ideas so now the society is just a collection of rules for living together in peace this is exactly what rule of law means that now if we have two different rules two different groups with different ideas about what is good and what is bad then the only thing we can do is we cannot make an appeal that look let us all agree to do something which is good together uh, we can only make a rule that this is going to be the rule everybody follow that rule whether it's good or bad it doesn't matter because so, uh, so now if a society has agreement on what is good or bad then they don't need rule of law and they did not need rule of law until the agreement on good and bad broke down. So then this uh, John Stuart Mill, basically the, uh, the freedom became a philosophy uh, when uh, the agreement broke down on goals. Because you see, freedom like wealth is an intermediate good. It is not directly desirable freedom is desirable because it gives you it makes you free to do what you want to do so freedom is freedom to pursue your goal if there is no goal then there is no freedom our freedom is irrelevant as uh, in Alice in the Wonderland Cheshire Cat asks Alice asks which direction should I go there are two paths so the cat asks well where do you want to get to so she said, it doesn't matter. I said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> then take whichever path you like. So if you are, you are free to choose, if you don't have any goal, then freedom is meaningless. But if you have a goal, yes, and you want to get to some place and you prevent you from doing that, then that's a harmful thing. On the other hand, if you're allowed to do what you want to do, then if you're not permitted, let's say, I, I say that we will not permit any of the women to do a soldiery so as long as the women are allowed to do what they want to do this is not a restriction on the freedom so if people have particular goals and purposes um, if, if I say to a prince that you are not allowed to sweep the uh, floor of the palace it is a restriction on his freedom but it will not cause him problems so there was a, 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 a agreement among men and women for a long time, no longer exists, that uh, women will take care of the family and the home and the men will take care of what's outside the home and make sure that the home can run. So while that agreement is there, the restriction on women to not have jobs is an unimportant restriction on freedom. It doesn't matter. 
But what happened in the West was that wealth became the only status symbol. And then uh, the value of uh, a person depended on what you can earn. So if a mother doesn't earn anything, then her job is valueless. And therefore, women said that, well, we can compete with men on their own grounds. And we will, and we want jobs. And so they did. That is fine and permitted and uh, allowed from the first day. Aisha Ta'ala was the greatest scholar of her times and many of the Sahaba used to ask her about the difficult issues. And throughout the centuries, there have been women intellectuals in Islam. Does freedom is a precondition to set the goals, individual goals? Yes, those are difficult questions we can. <laughs> freedom, um, basically, you see, if you are wise then um, and you have a lot of choices then freedom is good for you because you can decide that this is the best if uh, somebody is unwise and he does not know like the child is offered a choice between a burning coal and a uh, and, and a candy then he will uh, make the wrong choice so freedom can be harmful depending on freedom is not by itself always desirable So, all of these philosophers of the Enlightenment, Adam Smith, David Hume, and many others, Locke, uh, they were struggling with this problem that if there is no God, then, or if at least Bible is not reliable, then uh, how do we get to a moral theory? How do, why do human beings have morals? So, Adam Smith's book, Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, it says that basically every human being seeks uh, social approval. So there are things which, so if, if we are selfish and people don't uh, approve of this, then we will not be selfish. And individualism, our pursuit for uh, profits and gain, is opposed to social interest. And morality requires a balance between the two. I mean, in some cases, I, I am allowed to pursue my self-interest if it doesn't harm the society. And in other cases, I should sacrifice self-interest to the social interest. So, uh, he thought, and this has been a key point of division in Western philosophy uh, throughout history up till this day, now, once you see, once you remove religion, then you ask, is, what is the nature of man? Is man naturally good? If so, then we don't need rules and regulations. And then um, just let everybody do whatever they want. So one set of philosophers thought this. Uh, another set of thought, people, people thought that man is naturally evil. They are always this war of jungle, this law of the jungle. So in that case, we need a lot of rules and regulations and constraints to make sure that the society functions. So Adam Smith thought that man is naturally good, but there are corrupting influences on him. And these can lead man to bad behavior. This is exactly also the Islamic position that human beings are born good, but they are born on the fitrah of uh, Islam, but their parents can train them away from this. So, he said that one of the corrupting influences is the upper classes. The upper classes are automatically admired and praised. And since admiration and praise is the source of morality for Adam Smith, so if you are powerful, you can do whatever you like and people will say, wah, wah. And so, uh, they will uh, praise you. Even if you kill and murder and rob, people will say, wah, wah. So, uh, wealth, they will accumulate wealth by being immoral. But he said it's not too bad because well, the wealthy have a limited amount of consumption and so automatically 
the what uh, remains from there will go to the poor. So this is the beginning of the trickle down theory. And he said that as far as morality is concerned, the we can't do anything about it. Uh, this is shaped by uh, society and nature. If you want social regulation, the only thing that you need to do is justice. That's something where uh, the state needs to intervene to make sure that somebody who does wrong is punished. But general morality is too broad and uh, cannot be the concern of the state. As opposed to this, Hume was a purely secular and atheist and he had his moral theory that some morals are natural and innate which we feel good when we do the right things. All of these are theories which are currently operational I mean in Western philosophy and social science. The one is the theory that there is nothing inside we can be trained to be whatever we want by stimulus response. So uh, so uh, Hume says that some, some more as a natural we feel good when we do right things. Some are social constructs that is the society agrees that this is going to be considered as good behavior and punishes those who don't behave in that way and uh, rewards those who behave in that way. So we learn to behave in that way by the society concern. So um, Hobbes was one extreme. He thought that uh, he was another philosopher of the He said that man is inherently evil. You have to have rules. His book is called the Leviathan which says that there has to be an enormous state. You have to watch everything that human beings are doing and make rules about them. Otherwise, um, people are naturally evil and they will do terrible things. And he said that life will be a brute, nasty and short. It will be a battle of all against all. Locke, on the other hand, thought that men are naturally noble and, and so they don't need any <coughs> regulation. So Hume had an intermediate position. He had an empirical thesis based on observations. This was his, that people are sometimes selfish, sometimes they are benevolent and that he said their people are nationalistic, parochial, meaning that they are concerned with their own parish and they don't care too much about others. So towards their own people they will be kind but towards others they will be indifferent or negligent and there are conflicting emotions which lead in one way. So there is no particular <coughs> fixed theory. <coughs> so political theory was born first and economic politi uh, political economy came into existence and then uh, politics was divorced from economy. All of these are not um, due to as you have been taught to believe progress towards knowledge. Previously we knew less and then later we came to know more. These are all reflections of shifting historical circumstances in Europe. As the history and the environment and the circumstances change, so the theories uh, also changed. So if you want to understand history, we have to understand the theory at that time. So mercantilism was not a theory that is wrong. It was a theory that was suitable for its time. And when the times changed, the theory became inappropriate. So there are three um, uh, political theory initially in the religious period of Europe. 16th century. Uh, governments were um, there because it was the will of God and so uh, basically the ruler is the shadow of God on earth. The same phrase is used in Islamic context, zill ilahi. So uh, in that case you see the king rules by divine right and whatever he says you have to follow. As opposed to this, um, Hume and a group of thinkers in Europe uh, like Locke said that government are created by a social contract. We are all living individ as individuals in the wilderness and we have our own farms and our own property. But as individuals we are not very strong and somebody comes and robs us then we so we decide to get together basically to protect our property this is a very important Lockean theory so we agree that we will live together by certain rules so basically the government comes into existence 
due to a social contract or due to a agreement among ourselves as opposed to this another strand of thought which became popular in germany was that the governments create the social contract the uh, social contract theory is an imaginary theory nobody ever i mean uh, government nobody uh, people didn't actually ever get together and say okay let's create a government and let's write down these rules which we will all live by that's not how it happened actually the fact is that somebody powerful gains power and then he says these are the what the rules are going to be and you better follow them or else so once uh, uh, the government so the government is the creator of the social contract and it makes and the uh, and and the social contract is enforced by the government so anybody who doesn't follow uh, has to uh, be punished by the government so this is the theory of uh, so the social contract theory the uh, is democracy the government is democracy so the people are the source of the government as opposed to this fascism is the opposite theory that the state creates the social contract so this fascism is what led to hegel's philosophy which we will study and uh, hitler and uh, mussolini these were all believers in this second line of thinking so what they thought is that the government creates the law and so it is above the law because the writer of the law is above the law so the government there are no moral rules which apply to government so you can do any kind of torture you like All right I think this is enough for today